All right, so in this video, myself and my colleague Brian here are gonna discuss a little bit about Zeiss Calypso and specifically the cookbook. So if you're not familiar with it, if you have one of these Zeiss machines, you really should have a copy of the, the cookbook. It gives you basically the parameters for things you're measuring. It tells you how many points to make, what kind of paths to do, and, and you know, preferably everybody's using that same uh, uh, strategy and you get the same results. But there can be you know, issues where the cookbook isn't the best thing. And I'll turn it over to my colleague Brian here to kind of explain situations where you might not want to use the cookbook in its entirety. All right, so uh, the cookbook is sort of, you know, the Bible of the Zeiss machines. It has all the research done by Zeiss engineers to give you the best results possible. Um, the issue with it is a lot of the scanning speeds are slow. Um, it takes more time per run. And I mean, in my experience, let's face it, they, a, lot of, a lot of people don't want the part on the CMM that long. Uh, they want, you, you got to use the tools at your disposal as quickly as possible. Um, the concept really comes down to, you know, using tape measure, dial calipers, micrometer, gauge blocks, the same concept on the CMM. Because um, sometimes the CMM is used for looser tolerance work pieces, say plus or minus 30. But because the part is so large, it's easier to measure on the CMM because it's hard to fixture on the surface plate or whatever. Um, the CMM is not always for the maximum accuracy. It, it's not always the case. Um, again, if, you know, when it comes to the cookbook, Cite the cookbook when maximum accuracy is 100% required, or you are concerned with the data and are gonna to have to defend yourself in some sort of argument. That way you have something to cite when you're done. And I mean, not, not a negative argument, but you have to defend your decision on what that spec is. You have to cite the cookbook. Uh, that way you have something, unless they do trust your, imp, you know. Um, but I have found that a lot of times, especially on larger components, it's too slow. Um, and that even comes to the point beyond the cookbook, you know, do you scan or do you taste touch trigger points? Right. Um, I know Zeiss is very famous for scanning, all, these, all the machines, in my knowledge, scan that I've ran. Um, but the other brand machine I run um, at, another, at another job, it's touch trigger only, and it does very well with that. For average machine parts, plus or minus five, even plus or minus one, it's totally acceptable. Um, how many points you take is up to a debate. Right. Uh, things of that nature, but again, if you have a surface that's you know three feet by three feet and it has a flatness of thirty thousands, are you going to scan that to the cookbook? That's up for debate. It's going to take you know it could take thirty minutes to scan right. that, and they want that part measured in an hour. Right. Uh, you know. So again, you know, um, you, you know, Zeiss may disagree, but I have had no ill effects in my what I've had to do with the Zeiss machines um, or any CMM when it came to taking touch trigger points over scanning, unless you're looking for form to a tighter tolerance. I would say sub 2000s, depending on size, you know, obviously 2000s over three feet by three feet, that's large. But that, you know, something that makes sense. Um, if you're looking for, you know, a half a thou flatness spec and the surface is even any size, you should scan to the cookbook. Right. If you've got flatness within 30,000s, I mean, I just don't think it's necessary and time is money. That's what it comes down to. It costs money to run these machines, just like it costs money to make the part. Right. And that's a big issue. Um, you know, so again, what, what do you, you know, the CMM is not always, I already said this, but it's not always for the tightest tolerance work pieces. Right. You just don't throw it on there because the part's tight tolerance. That's not always the case. It doesn't have to be that way. Right. It's for convenience of measure, automation of measurement. And repeatable results. Right. Uh, it's not always for tightest tolerance. And again, they may not be the most accurate method, not the simplest method. Gauge blocks are by far simpler to understand. A good set of, you know, good set of gauge blocks, given the standard, whatever standard you want to pick from, whatever you can afford, is going to be more accurate and at least less room for error. Um, this is the thing as this, you know, gauge blocks and, you know, hard gauging become more accurate when the skill of the user decreases. That's in the gauging in the in the gauge uh, dimensional metrology handbook. Yep. Um, that's a big deal because they're simple. The downside to using things like gauge blocks is that you don't get data. Right, a gauge block will typically tell you if the part is good or bad. Things like gauges don't give you data, whereas ice machine or any CMM will give you too much data sometimes. You know, if you're looking, like Brian said, if the usually with GDMT prints. 
The primary datum, if it's a plane, it's going to have a flatness on it. The secondary datum will be perpendicular to the primary. It's just how drawings are made. So you're going to have these form and orientation tolerances that need to be checked. But say it's a cast or forging part, it might be plus or minus 30 thousandths. And you could just almost do a visual check and see if that surface is flat and take a couple points to establish that plane instead of having the Zeiss machine, you know, take 30,000 points on that surface and be pretty comfortable with those results. All right, so, you know, again, a couple of notes I have here, you know, accuracy costs money. And that's sometimes you don't want to overmeasure something. That's a big deal. So if you have something that, that you can use, I know a tape measure is very loose, and that's not what most machines are going to do. But it's simply saying that that's very simple, it's quick, it works. A scale would be a better option for a machinist. But you know, the t a tight tolerance is demanding and costly throughout the entire process. Right. End of discussion. The fact that it goes in the CMM, you know, you can try to save some time there. But if you, again, if you have a tight tolerance, you've got to follow the cookbook. That's my recommendation. All right, if you have tolerances that are considered tight or are extremely critical for whatever reason, where a couple tenths out of spec are going to make the part bad, I would 100% follow the cookbook, anticipating some sort of discussion about those results. Right. Um, other than that, I try to take touch trigger points because it's quicker when I can, or increase the speed of the scan path. But I tend to stay one inch a minute and below, and that could raise some room for arguments. I don't want to go faster than that because then my data gets very noisy, and it's, it's hard to filter it out. Um, I don't like that one inch a minute is as fast as I'm willing to go. Uh, beyond that, I will use touch trigger points um, right. on, on, on any CMM for them. Right, especially when you're locating a surface or you're inspecting a plus or minus, you know, a plus or minus. Even if it's five thousandths, you're, you're, if you put a plus or minus, uh, dimension and tolerance on a drawing, you know, you're not using GD&T, ergo people are going to think it's not as important, right? If it's plus or minus a tenth of a thousandth, uh, then you might have problems because even the CMM, there's multiple ways to kind of deal with that. There's several different two-point measurements you can do. And Zeiss Calypso, whereas if you put profile of a surface to a datum reference frame, it's very clear mathematically exactly what you're looking for. And then it just becomes a question of cookbook settings, scanning paths, how many points are you gonna take? Right, yeah, and then the focus is, is the cookbook setting when it comes to the strategies. Um, there are other valuable things, we don't wanna say negative things about the cookbook, it's excellent. Uh, there are other things in there like how to do um, composite controls or dual segment controls, very handy. I, you, I think I cite that page more than any other page. It's, it's very helpful. Um, so again, the problem is, is that I ran into this where the manager wants that part now and they're not willing to put three hours into a program. They're, they're not gonna wait for it. They're just not gonna inspect it sometimes. Yeah. And what are you supposed to do? Uh, you gotta, you gotta move along. Um, so, you know, either way, you gotta do what you gotta do sometimes, um, and you gotta get as good as results as are needed. Right. And here's another element to this puzzle. You know, Zeiss and the cookbook was written with ISO standards in mind. Right. They have the ASME. Uh, you know what you should do for ASME in there. But as far as the ASME standard, Y14.5, Y14.51, the math standard, and the new Y14.45 data measurement standard, nowhere in those does it tell you how many points you need to take to define a feature. Aside from the basic geometry, you need six points for a cylinder, that kind of thing. It doesn't go into the detail that the cookbook does. So there's somewhere between the ASME standard and the cookbook where somebody had to come up with these numbers. So with ASME, you're gonna have more wiggle room than you would with the ISO standards, which are much more specific about CMM stuff, right? Exactly how you're supposed to do it and what kind of data you're gonna get. So that's an important, especially in the US, that's an important distinction. It's easier to make your case for your decisions with ASME because it leaves it more uh, open to interpretation. Right. Yeah, a lot of the complaints, even when I started doing this, uh, you know, there was no, you know, I didn't run a Zeiss machine first, and there was no standard that I could find. So, in theory, if you have an 18-inch round diameter, you would take three hits and say something's round. Right. And, and it, no, anybody with common sense is going to say, that's wrong. But do you take 50 points? Do you take 20 points? 5,000. 5,000? What do you do? Now, on a touch trigger machine, it was easier because you're not waiting 
to take 18,000 hits on that. You would take whatever you know you see necessary. You also take the machining operation into account. It's harder to be unround sometimes. So you use your discretion. The skill of the operator comes in, but you gotta be careful with that because that now, you know, two people could be debating on that, right. you know? And, and that's a constant, there's a constant fight and it's getting better between the machine shop and inspection. Right. And then even worse is people pulling on the parts to get them down the road. That's why it's always, you, know, you usually see quality is separate from manufacturing as far as management chain. They are separate entities. The reason for that is you don't want manufacturing pushing quality along. You want quality to have its ground to stand on to make sure parts are good. And like Brian mentioned, if you're in a plant where you know how they're making things, say they're making things on a lathe, right? You can make assumptions about coaxiality. But if you're accepting parts that you didn't make, say from somewhere else, you have to take look at it from a different angle. You have to assume everything's wrong and then prove that it's right. So anything in-house, you can, you know, cut corners essentially. I don't want to put it like that, but you can make assumptions and it's really just up to the judgment of quality control to decide what they're going to accept as uh, truth and what they're going to spend time, like Brian's saying, valuable time inspecting. If you, you know, make round parts in the lathe a lot, that's all your plant does, you can make assumptions about coaxiality so you're not constantly checking things that turn out to be just fine, right? Maybe you check one in a thousand or one in ten thousand, right? Yeah, I mean, and it, it, that's, that's one realization is a lot of, some metrologists never even made a part before. So they don't, you know, they're, they're looking at things, they, they're not realizing that sometimes a machinist is already checking this. So on a lot of times when I'm running the CMM and I'm doing a final inspection, it's not in process, I will trust the CMM numbers more if they match what somebody already checked at the machine, especially for run out, if they're indicating things in. I know sometimes there's a free state debate and things like that, but if you're getting weird numbers in the CMM, things that, uh, I don't know, this is borderline out, if the machinist, if you were out there and they did a quick report and said, yeah, that was pushing it, the CMM's right, you're confident. If they have no data, or then they're gonna have data. The machinist should be inspecting something. Some sort of inspection happens at the machine to comp tools in or whatever. The setup, like, like Dean said, already comes in. If they bored a hole, it's gonna be round. Right. I mean, unless the part moves, there, you know, stresses the material, there's debate there. I know the comments could explode here. Within, re within reason, it's gonna be pretty round. Right. It's gonna be hard to get much better than that on average machine parts. If you wire EDM it, it's gonna be pretty round. Even though you still have X and Y fights, circumilling is debatable, drilling gets worse. You can take the, the manufacturing method into account because you've got to remember, the machinist is looking at the drawing and applying manufacturing methods to hold said tolerance. Right. Okay? The, the metrologist should be doing the same thing. Why are you putting everything, or what, you know, they'd be like checking it plus or minus 30 with gauge blocks, or, or even plus or minus 30 with micrometer. Right. What are we doing here? Right. It is harder to, it's quicker to use set calipers than a micrometer. Now you can argue about seconds, seconds add up. Right. And at the end of the day, what, what controls all of us in the manufacturing floor is making a profit. That is the goal. If the part, if the machine is flawless and perfect, well better than spec, and you lose money on the overhead, you're gonna shut down. So, and again, that hits the metrology. And, and I, that's one area where you have to use these tools like anybody else would. It's a tool. It's not the end all be all sometimes. These have their own sets of problems. You know, gauge blocks, I know they're the end all be all, but what if they're, mis what if they're not taken care of? What if they're dropped? Right. Uh, you know, who knows? So, you, you, you know, not, you gotta double check everything. So again, we're not shooting down the cookbook. The cookbook is 100% right. It is flawless and it gives excellent results and it gives you something to fall back on. The problem is, do you always have to use it? I guess that's the question. And I guess maybe some hardcore, you know, metrologists would be like, yes, I always use the cookbook. That's great if, you, if your facility has that in their budget and your parts require it, or even if they don't require it, good. That's fantastic, you're, you're doing 100% right. But in my experience, they don't want to wait for some of that, especially if the parts get very large. If the engine, you know, if the tolerance is large enough that, why are we scanning everything? Right. That's where it becomes yeah. a problem. When yeah. you're scanning large surfaces or, you know, uh, things that, you know, just located with plus minus dimensions to plus or minus 30 thousandths, scanning just doesn't make sense, even though the cookbook might specify it. And that's, you know, hopefully you watch this video and you can kind of make an argument for why you're not scanning and then, you know, yeah, have something to stand behind. Right. Especially with the ASME standard. 
Right, yeah, because some machines didn't, don't even have the capability of scanning. They're inspecting parts. Right. I know Zeiss has been scanning a long time, but other companies, they don't scan. Just point. Yeah, they're TP20 Pro, you know, they just don't. And they they do okay. Again, you may not be capturing the form. I guess I don't know if I said that earlier. The scanning, in my opinion, comes in place with form. Right, circularity. Yeah, process. that's when you can see, you get those beautiful graphs, and that's fantastic. Uh, but, you know, it's debatable for, uh, you know, positional tolerance. It really is. Uh, that, and, and, and let's face it, position's a big one. You know, right, that'd be like scanning position of a threaded fastener. I, I totally disagree with that, especially if it says to minor. Right. You know, um, a lot of times those insides aren't deburred 100%. They're just tapped or just thread milled. You know, if you are going to the minor, you know, or even let's say you're putting a, a thread gauge in yeah. and you're checking the thread, the thread is way around. Why are you scanning that? That's my opinion. You know, I'm open to see what sees in the comments. Um, everybody, you know, everybody knows everything in this field, so that's how it goes. Um, but again, that's been my experience because, uh, you know, you get the push from management and, you know, you got to get the data as cheap as possible. Right. Good data, yeah. you know. So again, treat the CMM like you would any other instrument, you know, um, and maybe that would help. Again, if you are not, if you don't need to go on a surface plate and use a, a test indicator and push it on a surface to check it, why are you having the CMM do it? That, that's my debate, um, but you know, it's nice that they actually have the information. Yeah. I'm not sure other manufacturers do, I, not to my knowledge, but yeah. I know Zeiss does. It was, it was super helpful to have something that's site in certain situations. It's always a good starting point. Yeah, you know? absolutely. If you have one of these machines and you don't have the cookbook, you know, give Zeiss a ring and get a copy. Yeah, yeah you uh, definitely want important. a copy because um, I've had to use it to defend my decision a couple times and it helps. And I'll, I'll, I think we both Let's agree with your program, start with the cookbook and then pull it back, right? right? If the cookbook, your program's gonna take three hours, then you can start looking at okay, I need to apply some different techniques here to shave some time off. Right. Yeah, because again, it's a manufacturing operation that right. is in the quote. Right. It's overhead and it has to be funded. And most, most people are not, don't want to fund metrology. That's been my experience. Right. They, they don't see a value added sometimes, um, especially when it's taking too long. You're overanalyzing data and they just don't want to pay for it. It's yep. not making the part. And that's a disadvantage because you do have to inspect it 100%. I mean, it needs to be done. It's an important thing. So, but I've been in that situation. So that's been my experience. Yep. So. Cool. But yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. So, uh, takeaway, like I just mentioned, cookbook, good. Start your programs with it. But there are situations where you can pull back, not scan, just do touch points to save time depending on you know your skill as a programmer. You know, don't go out on a ledge if you're not comfortable, but like we've discussed, there are reasons to stray away from the cookbook. And you got to remember, you don't have to totally delete your scan paths. You can do the single points checkbox and change it. You know, you, you can go back and forth from scanning as you wish. Right. You copy and paste your polylines and things like that. So you could have the scan path, and then if you have an error, you know, and just do a touch trigger point path, yeah. and then go back and forth as you see fit. Um, you don't have to reinvent what you're doing. Um, but if you want to try to make a little more, you know, cut and, you know, get rid of that overhead a little bit in the trial room, that helps. Yep. All right. Well, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, leave a comment down below. Let us know what you, uh, what you think about the cookbook and our discussion in this uh, video.